Hello, everyone. So we are back for this extremely exciting uh, panel discussion that I'm also hosting with uh, uh, Cecilia Canarozzo here about psychedelic neuropharmacology. We have Dr. Nichols and Dr. Olson who just had their lectures. Um, thank you very much for both of them for joining us today. Of course, the audience can still ask questions through the Q&A in Zoom and also about those questions that they want and we'll try to include them in the discussions that we're gonna have here now. I would like to start uh, with, the, I know Dr. Olson, you have just addressed this question, but I'm very curious about, about what's the position of Dr. Nichols on uh, the hallucinogen effects of psychedelics on the, determining the therapeutic uh, outcome of, uh, of these drugs. Do you think they are needed? I think it depends on what your goal is. Um, if we look at the different uses, MDMA, for example, reduces fear conditioning and dissociates traumatic memories from the affective components. So obviously there's no psychedelic effect there. Uh, depression and uh, addictions, uh, I think the jury is out. Um, Matt Johnson and their work has found that the people that had the most robust recovery from nicotine addiction had this so-called peak experience. So it, it may be what David says is correct, that that somehow is synergistic. I think in end of life, um, I think the end of life treatment with psilocybin, I think you do need the psychedelic effects because there is a, an existential crisis, which is different from just a major, major depressive disorder or treatment resistant depression. Those people actually get kind of a, I don't know what I would call it, a beatific vision, something that takes away their fear of death and knocks down a lot of their stress. I th so I think in that case, you probably do need the psychedelic effects. As far as uh, antidepressant uh, or anxiolytic, um, I think David's work is very important in really pinning down whether you need it or not. Um, so I, I kind of think on, it depends on what the paradigm is that you're, you're studying. In some cases, I think you probably need it, especially in end of life. In others, maybe you don't. And um, I would also want to ask you, what do you think is the role of neuroplasticity on the effects of uh, psychedelics when used uh, therapeutically? Well, it's, it's pretty clear that in the case of uh, ketamine, for example, and David has pointed this out, that you do have this uh, neuroplasticity. And that's the only really feature that people have seen that correlates with the antidepressant effect. So I think it, it probably is very important in the antidepressant effects, possibly in the anti-addictive effects. Uh, but I think it's an important phenomenon. Um, you're always, when you're a pharmacologist or doing this kind of work, you're looking at what's, you know, what, what's different, what's changed in the animal that's led to this. And the only thing they really find are, you know, these changes in the glutamate system and AMPA receptors and that lead to neuroplasticity. So, um, you know, I think, I think, I think it's an important phenomena and there'll be much more research to really pin this down. I mean, psychiatry is just, as I mentioned in my earlier talk, um, we're just at the threshold really of, of looking at these things. We've had 50 years of political interference with this kind of work. And David has been a pioneer in looking at this and a few others. And so we really need to have much more research and much more funding. But I think the neuroplasticity, I think is, is an important underlying phenomena for at least the antidepressant effects for sure. If I could just follow up on that. Sure. Um, so uh, I, I do think it's really important for us to uh, try to find, you know, find some causal evidence for, for this. And so far, you know, to be completely honest, everything that we've done with psychedelics uh, so far is, is correlative. We're seeing, you know, correlation with the, um, the structural plasticity and the antidepressant effects in rodents. But I want to point out that Connor Liston just this past year in science had a really nice paper related to ketamine where he actually, for the first time ever, I mean, it had been 10, 10 years or so where people have proposed that the mechanism of, the antidepressant mechanism of ketamine was related to spine formation in the prefrontal cortex. Connor's really beautiful paper showed a causal link. And the way he did that was he expressed a photoactivatable RAC1 in the dendritic spines that were formed after ketamine administration. So you form the spines and then he photoablated them and got rid of all of them. And then the antidepressant effects are gone. So that was the first time that that's really been done with ketamine. 
And uh, Connor and I are really hoping, you know, potentially to do something similar with psychedelics. But until we have that causal information, we, we still don't know for sure. We can go for questions from the audience. Um, so what do we know about intracellular signaling after psychedelic treatment and the changes that they induce long term? Who Dave, do you want to you want to you want to start this one? <laughs> well, um, with respect to the serotonin two A receptor, you know we know that G alpha eleven and fifteen, G alpha Q eleven and fifteen, seem to be the, the primary G proteins that are activated. That's been done with a technology called TruePath. Um, so, but but we you know that just measures the immediate activation of those G proteins. Downstream, uh, there hasn't been enough research to really know all the effects of those particular signals downstream. Do you have anything to add to this, uh, Dr. Olson? So this is just what are the long-term signaling, you know, cascades. Um, besides, you know, the activation of, of mTOR, that is something that seems to last for a very long time. Um, you know, the other signaling pathways, I think, are not super uh, well worked out. Very much related to your research, uh, Dr. Olson. Probably you are uh, familiarized with the ketamine metabolite RR hydroxynorketamine, which uh, seems to be a metabolite that can induce uh, plasticity or at least has an antidepressant effect in uh, rodent models, uh, but uh, would lack the, for instance, uh, addictive potential that ketamine, the parent drug, would have. Mm, do you consider that this could be a potential you know, hallucinogenic uh, psychoplastogen? If we consider ketamine as a hallucinogen, I know it's not really. Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's possible. Um, you know, this is that, that nature paper. I think it was by Carlos Cerati's uh, group. Um, very possible. I think the other thing to really consider about ketamine is uh, um, the, the enantiomers. And so something that a lot of people never paid attention to was, so you know, Spravato, which is uh, the nasal infusion for ketamine, which is based on S-ketamine. You know, S-ketamine is the, is the one that is more potent on the NMDA receptor. It also produces the more, you know, psychotomimetic effects. Um, and so, you know, they went forward with that, thinking it was the more, you know, quote unquote, potent compound. And it does seem to have some, some effect, um, but it seems that the R enantiomer is more effective in depression and the RNA antimer has less of the psychotomimetic effects. And so I think the, the jury is still out on that. I know there's a company that's dedicated to trying to bring our ketamine to the clinic. And so the hydroxynorketamine is, I would say, a very similar, in a similar boat. Are, are the RNS ketamine metabolized to the same extent, would you say, David? I, you know, that, that's known, but I can't remember. That's a good question. So another question from the audience. Leo Kirug asks, peak experience is not necessarily equivalent to or associated with hallucinations. Perhaps we should distinguish these two experiences, hopefully also in the animal studies. Dave, Dave do you want to comment? <laughs> I'm not actually sure what the question was. Yeah. You know, hallucinogen is a term that I've despised ever since I got in the field in 1969. Um, it, it really doesn't accurately reflect what they do. Um, really, when people have these high dose peak experiences, they're, they're called ineffable. Um, you know, I, I suppose you could say if someone is in a state where they feel like they're speaking with some disembodied spirit or watching the Big Bang or something like that, I guess you could say that's a hallucination, but uh, typically hallucinations are thought to be things that appear very real that you can't distinguish from reality itself. So I kind of just don't even like the term hallucinogen. And I noticed, noticed that Dave when, he was, Dave, when he was talking about ketamine, he said psychotomimetic. Um, I think psychotomimetic is probably a better term for sort of the untoward and un, you know, uncharacterized effects, things like even scopolamine. Uh, scopolamine may actually produce real hallucinations like the anti-muscarinics, but uh, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't. I don't think when people have a peak experience that they, they should be referred to as hallucinating, really. So, uh, going uh, back to these um, uh, embo compounds, the 25 cn uh, embo compound seems to be 
one of the most selective serotonin 2A receptor agonists, but uh, also seems to have a relatively weak effect according to Halberstadt's uh, research, if I recall correctly, uh, on the head twitch response in experimental animals. That's uh, in principle a proxy to this hall hallucinatory effects uh, of psychedelics in, in humans. How, how could we explain this? Well, you have to distinguish between potency and selectivity. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that the, the hydroxy compound uh, popped out, and that was work that was done in Copenhagen, uh, Martin Hansen, who what was a scholar in my lab for a while, did a lot of those. And really, they selected that because it had the highest selectivity for the 2A receptor. Um, and so the potency was less important than the selectivity. And so you see that a lot of people mistake that, well, if it's more potent, it's better. It's not necessarily true. It's interesting because we published a crystal structure. It's a cryo-electron microscopy structure of the, that N-hydroxy uh, N25CN compound. And uh, looking in the receptor, you, you can't see where that cyano projects at all. And all those compounds in that series, the 25B, the 25C, 25I, uh, you would expect as a chemist that there would be a hydrophobic region in that receptor. And the cyano, I thought maybe there was something that would hydrogen bond to the cyano group that would make it selective in 2A, but there's really nothing in there, at least, at least not at the resolution. The cryo-electron microscopy, don't, you don't get the re resolution that you get with the x-ray. So it was 3.4, I think, uh, angstrom. So, you know, maybe there's something in there that we didn't see. Well, you can't see, another thing is with the ENVO compound, uh, we don't know how the phenethylamines actually bind. It's well known that the orthomethoxy is critical for activity. And yet, if you look at that crystal structure, and anybody could get on and look it up in the protein database, there's nothing interacting with the orthomethoxy uh, or even with the 5-methoxy. So um, I kind of think that there are water molecules missing from that structure. So we don't really have a complete picture. But it is interesting for the uh, orthohydroxy phenyl, benzyl, that hydroxy is an acceptor of a hydrogen bond. There's this, in helix three of all these GPCRs, there's an aspartate, which is conserved in all the monoamine receptors. And one turn below is a serine, serine 159 in the 2A receptor. That serine hydrogen bonds to that oxygen. So we know that part of it, but the rest of it is still kind of a mystery. And we're trying to get structures of uh, mescaline and some of the other phenethylamine. So, and the technology on cryo-electron microscopy is really accelerating quite rapidly. There's a paper that just came out showing that they have uh, structures with a resolution of better than one uh, angstrom. So if that continues to improve, we'll get, we'll get better ideas, but. Um... Thank you. So maybe we can go ahead. Uh, Samuel Kothala from the audience is asking, ketamine, electroconvulsive therapy, sleep deprivation are all more or less rapid acting antidepressants, sharing the feature of increased cortical activation. How would you compare the effects of um, 5-HT2A um, agonists from this per perspective? And what about the non-psychedelic compounds? So in my opinion, they're, they're, they all do very similar things. Um, and it's just that, you know, uh, uh, ECT, TMS, exercise, sleep deprivation, you know, they, they do seem to cause this, this glutamate burst in the PFC, which does have changes in structure or cause changes in structural plasticity, just like psychedelics, just like non-hallucinogenic psychoplastogens. The only difference is that the, the other versions are maybe a little less potent and a little less selective because um, you know, ECT is affecting a lot of different brain regions, uh, you know, same with sleep deprivation. Um, but they are, they do have a, a shared uh, commonality in affecting the structure of, of PFC neurons. Another, a question that hasn't been answered is the robustness of a psychedelic versus ketamine. Ketamine is a fairly short duration of action. So you have to reapply it for a certain period of time uh, every week or so. And with the psychedelics, at least from what we know so far, their duration of the antidepressant effect is much longer. And no one has really come up, as far as I know, with an explanation for the difference in length of action. Yeah, I completely, completely agree with Dave on this. I think that's a really important question. And it does seem that the psychedelics seem to be a little more robust. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have another question from the audience from uh, Ines Ergisia. What is the role of microglia on the antidepressant effect of psychedelics? 
could its activation be involved in dampening down the neuroinflammatory processes present in depression? Who do you want to take this question first? <laughs> Well, I'll just say that uh, 5-HT2A is expressed on microglia. And uh, I think it's a very reasonable hypothesis to assume that these compounds might be dampening down neuroinflammation, in particular, based on, on Chuck uh, Nichols' work. Um, this is an unanswered question at the moment, as far as I know. Maybe Dave has some insights. Uh, maybe Chuck is working on some things that we don't know. But I know other groups are definitely interested in seeing the effects of psychedelics on microglia. Yeah, he has expressed the opinion to me on many occasions. Of course, he's doing work on psychedelics as anti-inflammatories. And he's suggested to me that the anti-inflammatory effect might be uh, responsible. Uh, I've said, well, I don't know. It seems like the therapeutic effect occurs too quickly. But then he points out the neuroinflammation uh, could persist for much longer. So it may be that you get an immediate antidepressant effect, but then the the neuroinflammation is suppressed by these, and that may be partly responsible for the long term. So again, it's kind of a mixed bag. We need a lot more research, a lot more money in this field, and a lot more investigators. I mean, uh, David, you probably know, is uh, David Olson is sort of kind of unique. There aren't many people like him who are entering the field with his level of expertise and, and insight. So we need a lot more people to be working in this field. It's just really important. So related to what Dave just said about, um, you know, the anti-inflammatory effects, maybe prolonging the antidepressant effects, I think that's a really interesting insight from Chuck. Um, there was a recent paper uh, from, uh, you know, the late Ron Duman and, and co-workers related to ketamine, where they took uh, ketamine and they gave a compound that um, reduced systemic inflammation in the periphery. And that drastically extended the antidepressant response of ketamine. And so maybe that, that could be one explanation for why psychedelics are better than ketamine is because in addition to their acute plasticity promoting effects, they also have maybe this more long lasting effects on systemic inflammation. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Julia is asking, when it comes to MDMA assisted psychotherapy for PTSD, if uh, she recalls it right, <laughs> the results were actually better with smaller dose, 100 milligrams, than with the bigger one, 125 milligrams. What do you think about this? So um, <clears throat> I came up with a compound years ago, which is an analog of MDMA. It's called MBDB. It's the alpha ethyl analog. Um, and it had qualitative properties very much like MDMA, but it lacked the dopaminergic psychostimulant-like properties. So I had a dialogue with Rick Doblin and I said, you know, I think you don't need that dopamine. And we'd done a lot of work with the neurotoxic effects of MDMA and rodent models. You know, that was very controversial. And we found it was directly correlated with the levels of a dopaminergic effect. And so MDMA releases serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And the psychostimulant properties, in fact, uh, Bruce Heifetz has shown this in mouse models, the psychostimulant effects are not necessary for its action. It's, they really confound things. Uh, MDMA is really kind of a messy drug. So I told Rick, I said, I, th I think, you know, you don't need that stimulant effect that, you know, this MBDB compound might be a good intactogen, would lack the psychostimulant effects, because the psychostimulant effects are what gives MDMA its abuse potential. People like to take it, they go to dances, they get feel pepped up. It's kind of a methamphetamine type effect. So he emailed me when they started doing their dose finding studies. And he said, you know, I think you're right. He said, we found that a 75 milligram dose of MDMA was therapeutic and it didn't produce any psychostimulant effects. And Rick had thought till that point that the psychostimulant effects were important in the overall uh, therapeutic action. So they use a dose, I think hundred milligrams and they use a booster, but they're just skirting at the edge of that, but I don't think you need the psychostimulant effects. In fact, if it didn't have psychostimulant effects, I think the abuse potential would be less problematic. You know, in terms of uh, regulating these drugs through the FDA, one of their concerns about uh, these drugs is their abuse potential. And you can say, well, you know, psilocybin, I mean, people take it, but it's not something that people just take to have a good time. You don't take psilocybin and go to dances and, and raves and things like that. But MDMA does. And I think if we had an intactogen that had less of a psychostimulant effect, uh, it would be therapeutic. It would be less problematic in terms of abuse potential. 
very good answer. <laughs> uh, we have another question from the audience here that is related to neuroplasticity. It is, may induction of neuroplasticity underlie the increase in suggestibility seen in study subjects during and after psychedelic experiences? Possible. Um, I think that particularly maybe, you know, in the after effects, um, again, I think it's just, you know, when people say, again, when we say plasticity, I'm not really referring to, um, you know, uh, ability to modulate in a lot of different directions. We're really talking about just the change in, in the structure of certain circuits. Um, and so, but those circuits are really important for suggestibility and some other things. So, so maybe it's, it's involved. I think it's here it's probably relevant to consider the fact that uh, they've shown that um, psychedelics increase the personality trait of openness. Openness includes lots of things, uh, environmental concern, humanitarian issues, uh, philanthropic ideas, suggestibility, they probably all fall into that. It's probably a constellation of things that they do that's related to this personality trait of openness. Yeah, and that person, those types of personality traits are heavily dependent on the prefrontal cortex. And so, yeah. Thank you. Um, another question from um, the audience, Giuliano Di Dio is asking, is it known whether these drugs through activation of serotonin receptor modulate the electrophysiological properties of neurons, maybe decreasing the threshold of for action potential? If so, could this hypersensitivity of neurons explain at least the hallucinogens? Because neurons that would not otherwise be activated would start firing with very little input. I, I mean, I think that's a, a, a really good question. You know, at least uh, acutely when uh, under the influence, um, there, there does seem to be kind of like a, a turning up of the gain. And, and so, you know, maybe in the, even in the, like the visual cortex, for instance, some of those neurons could be reaching threshold that normally wouldn't. My personal view, which I, you know, this is from some research that we haven't published yet, so I don't really want to get into it too much, is that there are um, other circuits in the brain that are really important for mediating the hallucinogenic effects of the drugs. Um, so it's not simply just the turning up the game, but there definitely is uh, this, this, this in increased cortical activity, broadly speaking, which um, makes it a little harder to, differ to, to selectively attend to certain things. And so you get a lot more uh, sensory information kind of, you know, uh, overwhelming you. Um, but in terms of the excitability of the neurons after the fact, after the drug has been eliminated, um, we haven't published this yet, but there's, uh, you know, intrinsic excitability, which you can measure with electrophysiology does not really seem to change as much as say, uh, spontaneous excitatory postsynaptic currents do. So there's a, another issue. So uh, George Agajanian at Yale did a lot of work looking at electrophysiology of, of cortical neurons. And what you see when you apply something like LSD is you see a depolarization, but not generation of action potentials. So he observed that you saw this generation of these postsynaptic excitatory potentials, but then there was an asynchronous polar depolarization that started to occur, and they were trying to figure out what it was, and they said, it looks like it's this agglutamate flood that's coming in. So then there were studies by uh, a, a, a group, Baik is the first author, um, and he said, you know, there's neurons in deeper layers of the cortex, not in five, but deeper layers that may be sending glutamate projections up. So then my son developed a procedure for looking at uh, cell types, uh, fluorescent cell sorting, and found that in deeper layers of the cortex, and in particular in the clostrum, where the expression of 5-H2A receptors is uh, three to four-fold higher than in regular layer five cortical neurons, that uh, they actually generated, um, he used DOI, actually generated action potentials. And those neurons project glutamate up into layer five. So it Ordinarily, you get an increase in gain just by depolarizing cortical pyramidal cells, but these deeper layer cells that start generating action potentials and releasing glutamate are probably involved. So maybe at you know, low doses, you get these changes in perception, et cetera, but these high doses could be related to activation of these cells in deeper layers of the cortex, presumably including something like the, the clostrum. In relation to glutamine, I know we are discussing this, we also know that um, serotonin uh, receptor 2A 
uh, heterodimerizes with uh, metabol metabotropic uh, glutamate receptors 2, 1, 3. And I was wondering uh, what, uh, what do you think or what do we know about the role of uh, heterodimers uh, or heteroreceptors, heterocomplexes in um, the role of, of these uh, complexes in the action of psychedelics? In the lab where I work with Brian Roth, you would not mention heterodimers in his lab. Uh, he would say, don't talk to me about heterodimers. Um, it's still controversial. There's one, you know, only one really lab that's really promoted this idea, I think. The problem is the 2A receptor is postsynaptic and the MGU2 receptors are presynaptic. And so it's hard to envision how they could form a heterodimer. So I think those results are viewed somewhat skeptically. I mean, um, uh, Gonzalez Mesa does I think he does good work, but I think there are questions about whether that really is relevant, whether that occurs with the 2A receptor. And I know Brian Roth, who's kind of a master of the G protein coupled receptor stuff, you know, don't even mention heterodimers to him. It's like, that's bullshit. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> yeah. So I think that, you know, the question is still unanswered as to whether that's relevant, has any role or even happens in, in vivo. Yeah, I think Dave's right. It's a, it, it is an open question, but it's a really intriguing one. Um, I think particularly because the two-way receptor is known to interact with a lot of partners, dopamine receptors, cannabinoid receptors, other modulating proteins. And I think that's something that in general in neuropharmacology, in modern neuropharmacology, that I think that the entire field needs to keep in mind is that the collection of proteins that surround a receptor influences function. And uh, so a 2A receptor in one part of the brain may not be the same as a 2A receptor in a different part of the brain, depending on what its reacting partners are. And this is an area for modern neuropharmacology research to really, to really dig into. Actually, the studies that uh, Javier Gonzalez Meso did were in the somatosensory cortex, which has a different expression pattern than in prefrontal cortex. So his studies with heterodimers there may not be relevant to what's happening in prefrontal cortex, which is the major target. A very complex topic. Maybe we have time still for one last question. So um, one question from the audience. In light of their neuropharmacology, do you think psychedelics hold any potential to treat neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease and why? Well, I, I'll, I'll take this question first because uh, we've applied for several grants in this area. We've gotten two of them from uh, NIH. Um, and so, you know, my group is, is very interested in, in this, this topic. Um, I think it would, they will be more useful for neurodegenerative diseases um, that are, are primarily, you know, affected in the cortex, so like frontotemporal dementia. For those that really involve atrophy of the hippocampus, I think they're going to be less uh, useful, but I, I think they have potential. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, I, I don't know if they're going to be therapeutic in reversing things like Alzheimer's. It's possible though that they might improve cognitive function early Alzheimer's. And I know uh, there's at least one group that's looking at the use of low doses of LSD in early stage Alzheimer's to see to improve cognitive function. I don't think they're gonna be therapeutic because it is a degenerative process that we don't understand, but it may be that they'll be useful in early, early Alzheimer's or other cognitive disorders to try to improve cognition. When you, you activate these 2A receptors on cortical primal cells. They're, I mean, they're the, the key computational units in the cortex. And so cognitive function, short-term memory, all these things are modulated there. So if you're losing that function, it may be that you can get some enhancement with these substances, but I don't think they'll be ultimately therapeutic. They won't re reverse uh, these types of disorders. Very interesting. I think we actually have time for uh, one very, very last question. <laughs> Uh, it's a question from uh, Sarah Adolfsen. If a person takes psychedelics and at the same time has unexpected traumatic experiences and related to the drug effects themselves, how can this change the brain? And is it permanent or is it reversible? You're talking about somebody having a bad trip or? I guess that's what uh, Sarah refers to. That's what I understand. Well, in the 60s, there were lots of bad trips that were not treated properly, and those people will say they were never right again. 
Um, you know, a lot of times people would be in the middle of a, a really big trip and they would go to the hospital and they would shoot them, give an injection of Thorazine, Corpomazine, something, and just abort it. And there were always suggestions that they were in the middle of some unresolved emotional process and you just froze it. And there were a lot of people that said, you know, it's like when you get thrown off a horse, you have to get back on and show that you're not. So I don't know if there's anything to it or not, but obviously trauma is really powerful. I mean, PTSD, and people can get PTSD from all kinds of things. So, uh, uh, and PTSD can have, you know, lifelong consequences. If you're traumatized as a child, you can still carry that into your adult life. So I think, uh, in any kind of a situation, if you have trauma, and especially maybe if you were taking a psychedelics, could maybe even amplify the trauma. I mean, in bad trips, um, you know, people can think that the police are trying to kill them. Um, and, uh, you know, that could be a terrible situation. So I think that kind of trauma could have very long term consequences. I don't know if that answered the question exactly, but I'm curious if Dr. Olson uh, would say that this is uh, related to enhanced neuroplasticity or is it something else? I, 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 I don't think that it would be related to enhanced neuroplasticity. I think a lot of the, you know, the anxiogenic effects of the, the compounds, you know, come from their acute activation of the amygdala, but like the long lasting effects seem to have the opposite effect on the amygdala. Okay. So uh, thank you very much. So this was the very last uh, question, I promise. The time for uh, our panel has come to an end and we would like to thank uh, Dr. Olson and Dr. Nichols for joining us today and having such a vibrant discussion. Again, thank you very much to the audience for their very uh, lively participation. And we look forward to seeing how this fascinating field develops and to which uh, new avenues will psychedelic research open for neuroscience and for the treatment of nervous system disorders. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Yep. Thank you.